Amen. James chapter 2. So James chapter 2 is going to be the focus of our sermon this evening, or our sermon this morning, I'm sorry. And James chapter 2, um, while it's one of my favorite chapters in the entire Bible, um, didn't always start out that way with me. It was confusing for many ways um, at the beginning. Many people um, misunderstand James chapter 2, and I think that James chapter 2 is probably the most misunderstood or uh, misused is maybe a better term, uh, you know, chapter in the Bible. What we're going to focus on this morning is verse number 10. You know, James chapter 2, many people use to teach works-based salvation. Many different um, churches use James chapter 2 for that. But what I want to focus on is verse number 10. We're going to talk about something different other than that. Look down at James chapter 2 and verse number 10. Or um, look at the front of your bulletin. It's the verse of the week where the Bible says, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. So, what I want to talk to you about this morning, and it's kind of a primer, as I said, to go into the last um, part of the book of Judges, is this idea or this doctrine or this teaching out there that all sins are equal. And I want to go through it this morning with you and explain James chapter 2 and verse number 10. So James chapter 2 and verse number 10, this idea of all sin is equal. Uh, look, I was, I was brought up with this uh, teaching myself that all sin is equal in James chapter 2 and verse number 10 is what is used to teach this. So first of all, to understand James chapter 2 and verse number 10, I've mentioned this before, I'm going to mention it again, our methodology whenever we read a verse in the Bible that people have either used or are teaching something with it is, is very simple. Just start reading um, several verses before and several verses after and you will see the context of the verse and it will make sense to you. So let's go ahead and do that this morning. Let's look at James chapter 2. Look up at verse number 1. So let's look at, I mean, the Bible says, whosoever keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he's guilty of all. So, you know, first of all, that does not say that all sin is equal, but that's what's used to say that God, all sin is equal in the eyes of God is what churches are teaching today. But let's look at what's happening in this story. Let's look at the situation on the ground in James chapter 2. Two. It starts out in verse 1. My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. There you go. If you don't mind writing in your Bible, just underline respect of persons in that first verse. This is the context of the beginning of James chapter 2. The fact that they were having respect of persons. Highlight that. Underline it. That's the problem that we're talking about right here. Look at verse 2. Now he gives an example. He says, you're having respect of persons, and here's what you've done. For if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring in goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit under my footstool. So basically, respect of persons means that you're treating certain types of people or certain people different than you're treating other people. And then he gets more specific, and he says, Look, the problem that this place is having, that this church is having, is that they're treating people with money that are dressed well and that have money different than people that don't. If there's a poor person, you know, they're kind of ignoring that person. They're taking the people with money and with the nice clothing and with the jewelry and they're setting them in the best spots. I mean, what, first of all, why wouldn't I do that? Why wouldn't I find the people with the most money and just like be the nicest to them and all this? Because look, that's going to be better for the finances of the church. I want those people to keep giving money, right? This is churches today. Okay? I mean, look, we're not to have respect of persons. And, and, and if a pastor or a leader of a, a ministry has respect of persons, this is exactly what you get. This happens today, folks. People that, I remember a church that I was in, I was on the school board at the church that had a school as well, and I remember there was a very wealthy family that did not go to that church and wanted to change the doctrine of the church. And everybody at the, on the school board was like, oh, They've got eight kids in the school, and they, uh, there's a lot of it. I mean, and I'm like, are you kidding me? Yeah. Look, I was Lutheran at the time. But I was at least like, they can, you know, they can either adhere to the doctrines of this church or don't let the door hit you. And everybody on the school, oh, 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 yeah, that's what we meant too. But look, it's very common for people to want to have that mindset to be thinking about having respect of persons even today. Even in, you know, false 
gospel churches like the Lutheran church I was in. They'll have respect of persons. So this was the problem that we're talking about. This is the context. They were treating certain people better than others because of the fact their financial situation. Look at verse number four. Are ye then not partial in yourselves and are become, become judges of evil thoughts? Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom which he had promised to them that love him? But ye have despised the poor. Underline that. So they had respect of persons in the specific way of despising the poor. Do not then, do, do not they blaspheme the worthy name by which they are called? He said, by doing that, God has said that the poor are going to inherit the earth, the meek will inherit the earth. It's, he's talking about how, you know, had God not chosen the poor, you don't think God has chosen the poor in the context of the poor are going to be more open to the gospel, the poor. Look, you've never been so any. Right, right. Not one time. But they've despised the poor. And by doing that, they're blaspheming what God has said, is what he says. Verse number 8, If ye fulfill the royal law according to the Scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. So, ooh, now he points out the law that they're breaking. Because they're saying, we love our neighbor as ourself. He's like, hey, if you do by that royal law, it's the law given by the king, the law given by God. For whosoever, but ye have respect to persons. Ye commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. It means you're convicted. He's saying, you say that you love your neighbor as yourself, but you're, you're convicted of it, you're guilty of it, you're a transgressor of it right here in the verses I just read you by having that respect of persons. Verse 10. Now it kind of sounds different, doesn't it? Now when we look at verse 10, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. So look, it starts out by talking about this specific sin that they were committing, having respect of persons, despising the poor, and it turns into the context of chewing them out in verse number 6 and thinking that they were following the law. Turn to Leviticus chapter 19. Let's look at the law. Look at Leviticus chapter 19. They say that they were following the law, and he's telling them that they're not following the law. Okay? So I want to look at this in the context of this one law first. Just, let's just think about this one law. You know, love thy neighbor as thyself. Look at Leviticus 19, verse 18. I'm going to read you the Old Testament law. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. They thought or claimed to be following this law. It's the second greatest commandment, according to Mark chapter 12, according to Jesus. And they were not. And verse 9 showed that they were not fulfilling this law. And verse 10 says, you're a transgressor of it. That's what he says. So, basically, let me give you an example of this. A church teaches that thou shalt not steal. I mean, this church will teach thou shalt not steal. You know, thou shalt not steal, don't steal money, don't steal cars, don't steal anything. Yet, they encourage people not to tithe. They don't teach tithing. They say you don't have to tithe. Look, they're encouraging people to steal. Well, I'll just read it for you. Malachi 3.8 says, Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. So basically, these people, you may, okay, so I don't steal cars. So we're talking about the law in this example of stealing. I don't, I don't steal cars. I don't rob banks. But you know what? Every time I go to Home Depot, I throw a candy bar in the bag. You're still a thief. You see what I'm saying? That's what James chapter 2 and verse number 10 is talking about. When it comes to the one law, they're like, oh, we, we, we follow this law. But he's saying, you're, you're breaking it. If you break it in one point, you're guilty of it. You're a transgressor of it. And then he applies it in verse number 11. He applies it to the entire law. Look at verse number 11. Look at verse number 11. Verse number 11. For he saith, do not... Do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. Now if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art becoming a transgressor of the law. Look, this is not about all sin being equal. It doesn't even say that. This is about whether or not you are a transgressor of the law. Amen. Whether or not you are a transgressor of a law, like stealing, or like loving your neighbor as yourself, or a transgressor of any law. If you break the law in any point, you're a transgressor of the law. Amen. Is what this is saying. And that's all it's saying in the context of him chewing them out over not fulfilling the second greatest commandment. 
which is, you know, treating their neighbor as themselves. So look, all sin is equal in the eyes of God? I mean, I was raised on this. And I I'll, I'll, I'll never, un never understood it. I never understood it. It never made sense to me logically. I, I never got how it, could, how it could work out. And I'm super glad that it's not true. Let, let me put it that way. So we're going to talk about it. Let's just do a quick Bible study proving to you that all sin is not equal. And then I will give you some examples of why this doctrine is so dangerous. It's so dangerous to you personally, to your family, and especially, you know, to the church. It's dangerous. Turn to John chapter 19. Let's do a Bible study. And let's see if, you know, I mean, we could stop right here because we just looked at the, look, we just looked at the context of James chapter 2, and it was very easy to understand the context, was it not? So don't ever forget that methodology. Whenever somebody is using a verse and they're saying, oh yeah, well the Bible says this, faith without works is dead, just read the context of five, six verses before, you know, five, six verses after. And you and the Holy Spirit will work that thing out. Every time. That's how the Bible works. Look at Jesus. John 19, look at verse number 11. Let's look at this. Let's just do a Bible study. John 19, verse number 11. Jesus answered. Now he's talking to Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate is basically telling him, why aren't you speaking to me? He's like, I have the power over your life. And Jesus says this. He says, thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore, he that delivereth me unto, you, unto thee hath the greater sin. Underline that. So he's basically saying to Pontius Pilate, those that brought me here are convicted of a greater sin than you. So if there's a greater sin, then there's a lesser sin. I mean, this is, you know. All right, so it, 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 but doesn't that match your conscience, by the way? Where does your conscience come from? We'll get there. Turn to 1 John chapter 5. It doesn't seem right that stealing that candy bar from Home Depot would be considered equal to murdering somebody. I mean, if you think that that's right, please stop coming to church here. 1 John chapter 5, look at verse number 16. We'll get to that too. <laughs> look at 1 John chapter 5 and verse number 16. The Bible says, If any man see his brother sin a sin, which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. Underline that. And I shall not say that he shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. Underline that last part. So, look, there's a lot in this verse, and this verse could be, you know, preached on as a sermon. But look, there is clearly, what we see in these two verses is that there is a sin unto death, and that there is a sin not unto death. I don't even have to explain that even anymore. There's a sin that is unto death, and there's one that is not. Leading us to the conclusion that not all sin is dealt with the same way by God. Amen. Thus, not all sin is equal in the eyes of God. Amen. But here's another thing. Turn to Matthew chapter 23. Well, not all sin is equal, the punishment is also not equal for sin. So, I mean, that would make sense, right? I mean, which is kind of confusing. I mean, even our own laws in this country wouldn't make any sense if you think about the fact that all sin is equal. So, why is there a different punishment for stealing a car and murdering somebody? If all sin is equal in the eyes of God, it wouldn't make sense. Even, look, nobody believes this. I mean, why do people go and listen to something that they don't believe? They don't believe this. Look at Matthew chapter 23. Look at verse 13. The Bible clearly teaches that there is different punishment for different sins. Look at Matthew. We're just talking about Jesus right now. Okay, we'll get to the Old Testament. Matthew 23 and verse 13. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees. Jesus is the whole Bible, by the way. Amen. Jesus is the Word. He's the whole Bible. So basically, we're going to be talking about Jesus all day, every day, for the rest of this church's life. Right? But look, we're just talking about you know, teaching from Jesus right now. Matthew 23, verse 13. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. So he's like, he, you know, Jesus and the Pharisees, you know, not on the same page ever, right? He's saying to them here, he's saying, look, you're not only not saved, you're not only, you know, going to go to hell, but he's like, the worst thing about them, 
The worst thing about false prophets is that they're stopping other people from getting saved. They're stopping other people from going to heaven. And then look what he says. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long, long prayer. Therefore, because of this, ye shall receive the greater damnation. He's like, look, you're in more trouble. And he doesn't say greater punishment on this earth. He says greater damnation. That's eternity. There's a greater damnation. There's a greater punishment. Turn to Revelation chapter 20. Look, which makes perfect sense when you think about how the unsaved are going to be judged. When you look at how the unsaved are going to be judged, this quote by Jesus here makes perfect sense. They're going to receive greater damnation. Doesn't that mean that some people will receive lesser damnation? If there's damnation that's really big, obviously there's people that are, you know, somewhere lower on the scale. I mean, it's still damnation. It's still damnation, but it's a lesser damnation if there's a greater damnation. Look at Revelation chapter 20. The Bible explains how unsaved people are going to be judged. It explains it. In the great white throne judgment after the millennial reign, look at verse number 11. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open, and another book was open, which was the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books. What were these books that were being... You know what these books were? These books were the law. They were judged... How do I know that? How do I know that? They were judged out of those things that were written in the books according to their works. These people, the unsaved, look, the unsaved are going to be, look, you, if you're saved by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, you are going to be, you are going to be, you have the, the righteousness of Christ covering you. But unsaved people that have not believed on the Lord Jesus Christ will be judged by their works. I am glad I am not on that list. Amen. Look at verse 13. And it says it again. I mean, whenever the Bible is repeating things, it, 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 you know, pay attention. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and the death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. These people, the unsaved of this world, are going to be judged according to their works, folks. So it's ironic it's poetic justice, whatever you want to call it, that people that believe in their own works, people that have not believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, but they're believing on their own works to get them to heaven, they will be judged on their own works. They will be judged, and there will be no more grace. It will just be what their works are. And look, are everybody's works the same? Are everybody's works, you know, as, as evil? I mean, this is a perfect explanation, by the way, when you go out soul winning and you meet that, that really nice guy and he just doesn't want to hear the gospel. He just, you know, he just doesn't really care. He hasn't been raised, but you know, he's, he's, you're just like, man, he he's, seems nice. He seems sincere. And I wish he would just listen to the gospel. But he doesn't. Well, then there's other people that you'll meet and other people that you'll see and other people that you'll read about in the news and you're like, man, I'm glad there's a hell. Where, where, you're, where you're looking at that guy when we're out soul winning, at, you know, when we're in this community trying to share the gospel with people, you'd be like, man, it's a, it's a shame that somebody like that would not believe and not want to believe. But look, the, the, the serial killer and that guy, there, there's, the damnation's going to be different. It's still damnation, unfortunately. And that's why it makes me sad when people like that don't want to hear the gospel. You know, it, it, it just, you guys have heard it from me. When we meet that guy, you've heard it from me out so many, man, I wish, what could I have said to that guy? Why can't I be better at, you know, convincing someone of the seriousness of the situation that they're in? Why, you know, I need to get better at this in my life so maybe I could, I could help and save and help that guy get saved more often or that gal or whoever. Look, I mean, you got, I mean we care about people. We don't want anyone to suffer damnation, except, you know, some people you do, though. Some people you're like, you know, I'm glad there's a hell. But for everyone on earth, there are different punishments for different sins. And look, turn to Leviticus chapter 20. 
Let's go to the Old Testament. Even in God's, in God's government, when God was in charge, when God was in charge, there were different punishments for different sins. Look at Leviticus chapter 20. Look at verse number 9. When God was running the show, there was not just one punishment for, for everything. It, it would be ridiculous on its face. That's why I'm telling you, nobody believes this. Yet they listen to it again and again and again. Look at Leviticus 29. Verse 9, For everyone that curseth his father and his mother shall surely be put to death. He that cursed his father and his mother, his blood shall be upon him. And the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, and he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. And the man that lieth with his father's wife hath uncovered his father's nakedness, both of them shall be surely put to death. Their blood shall be put upon them. And if a man lie with his daughter-in-law, both of them shall be put to death. As they have wrought confusion, their blood shall be upon them. If a man also lie with mankind, as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination, they shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. If a man take a wife and her mother, it is wickedness. They shall be burnt with fire, both he and they, and there be no wickedness among you. If a man lie with a beast, look, the Bible covers everything. He shall surely be put to death, and you shall slay the beast. And if a woman approach unto any beast and lie down there too, thou shalt not kill the woman and the be thou shalt kill the woman and the beast. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. Look, I mean, here you're seeing this list of sins: cursing your parents, adultery, lying with a beast, homosexuality, being a homosexual, incest. I mean, there's several incest scenarios listed here. They're all punished by death by when God was in charge of, of the nation of Israel here. You know, others, others, um, you know, there's other death penalties as well. Exodus 21 talks about um, men, man stealing. We had a whole sermon on this. This would be, you know, slavery of the early Americas. You know, that would be punished by death. Stealing men would be punished by death. That's why, oh, the Bible, you know, it, it condones slavery. No. That's, that's another sermon in itself. But men stealing was punished by death. Rape was punished by death. Deuteronomy 22. That's another. That's why you have to have a King James Bible too, by the way. When it talks about, you know, laying hold on someone, it's different. It's a different meaning than force someone. It's punished by death in the Bible. Look, it's all punished by death. But look, turn to Exodus 22. Not all sins are punished by death in the Bible. Look at Exodus 22 and verse number 1. Stealing. Stealing is not punished by death in the Bible. Look at um, Exodus 22 and verse 1. I'll just give you a couple examples. There's a lot of sins that are not punished by death, which would make sense. Exodus 22, verse 1. If a man steal an ox or a sheep and kill it or sell it, he shall restore five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. Look, if you steal something from somebody, you are to pay them back so many times. If someone steals your car, they have to give you four cars. This is the, the rule in the Bible. Look at Exodus 21 and verse 12. Even manslaughter. You say manslaughter. You know, all these different rules. Even manslaughter is covered in the Bible. And it is not punished by death. You say, man, the Bible is really specific. The Bible covers everything. People just don't preach everything anymore. The Bible has all the answers. Look at Exodus 21 and verse number 12. The Bible says, He that smiteth a man so that he die shall... Be surely put to death. Well, that matches. Look at verse 13. And if a man lie not in wait, but God deliver him into his hand, then why appoint thee a place whether he shall flee? But if a man come presumptuously upon his neighbor to slay him with guile, thou shalt take from him from mine altar that he may die. So this is talking about if you plan on killing somebody, verse 14, it's like that's murder, you're going to be put to death for that. But he's talking about, you know, situations where, you know, two men get in a fight. And when man gets killed, there are other manslaughter situations you could look at where maybe you didn't mean to kill somebody, but he smiteth him and killed him. Then, you know, it's manslaughter. It's not the death penalty. That's where the sanctuary cities come from. But it's not the death penalty is the point I'm trying to get at. So look, there's clearly punishments for different sins that are different in God's government is the point I'm trying to make. And look, while we don't follow this today, this is how God runs things, so it must be right. 
And we have to remember that. No matter what you've been taught, no matter what you think you know, just listen to what the Bible says. Look, so not, what do we learn? We know that all sin is not equal. We know that punishment is not equal in the afterlife and in this life, according to God. So, we've pretty thoroughly proven from, I mean, a very simple Bible study that all sin is not equal in the eyes of God. The Bible does not teach anything close to that. Amen. People just take one verse out of context, and, and they don't even take the verse out of context well. They just take a verse and then change the meaning of that verse, and then everyone's like, oh, even though they don't believe it anyway. So the next part of the sermon, the last part of the sermon I want to give you is, is why does it matter? Why does it matter? I want to give you some points on the dangers of this doctrine. So, look, the first thing is this. The first point I want to make is this. How would it work? I'm a pragmatic person in a lot of areas. What, what's the pragmatism of this whole thing? Think of the pragmatism of, you know, if there was a small punishment for big sins. Let's just say we just had one small punishment for every sin. I mean, how would that work? But the funny thing about that is we actually have a case study in the Bible about that. Okay, so look, um, God flooded the earth, right? Didn't God flood the earth in Genesis? He flooded the earth. So for those of you that don't believe in the death penalty, by the way, there's already a case study for this. God flooded the earth. Turn to Genesis chapter 6. Why did he flood the earth? Let's look at this real quickly. Did he flood the earth because of global warming? Did he flood the earth because of coal-fired power plants? Okay, look, that's what Hollywood is teaching, apparently. That, you know, it was to stop the environment from being destroyed, so God flooded the earth. The, God, the Bible is very specific on why God destroyed everyone on the earth. It's very specific. There is no misunderstanding. He repeats himself. Look at Genesis 6, verse 11. The earth was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with, underline this word, violence. Violence can be looked at as, you know, people hurting or destroying or causing harm or evil to the innocent. The earth was filled with violent and God looked, violence, and God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. So look, the earth was corrupt. And you could say, okay, it's corrupt for what reason? Well, we, we heard in the verse before that that it was violence. That's what it was. And then he says again, it was corrupt. And it was corrupt. He corrupted his way. It, how? And God said unto Noah that the end of flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence. This is the one reason that he gives twice. The corruption. Look, and if you know anything about God and the nature of God, it's that he, he hates it when the innocent is hurt. That's why we got something coming for abortion in this country. Amen. It's coming. Whether we like it or not, whether we fix it tomorrow or not, it's judgment's coming. Amen. Judgment's coming because God hates it when the innocent... Look, that is violence. I preached an entire sermon on abortion. It's the definition of violence. You know, killing the innocent. There's nothing more innocent than an unborn child, human being, that literally cannot protect itself from anything and we kill it but well, this country is filled with violence because of that now back to the sermon turn to Genesis chapter 9 Genesis chapter 9 so God destroys the whole world except for Noah and his family in the ark look this is this happened this is a literal story. This isn't a cartoon. This is another reason that we don't have Sunday school. This is not a cartoon uh, color book. This happened. There was a man that built a ship and all these animals were put on it and God flooded the whole world, world and killed everyone but his family. That, that happened. Look at Genesis chapter 9. And then God institutes a new rule. Genesis chapter 9, look at verse 6. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God was he made man. God doles out punishment through the flood, but he also offers a solution to the violence here. He offers a solution. He institutes the death penalty here. What sense would it make to operate the same way? If we learn anything studying the Bible, it's that man does not change. <laughs> if we learn anything. And, and look, God is tuning up his management technique here, is, is what he's doing. Okay, so the first thing that we see, the first danger that we see from this doctrine, and look, every, every false doctrine is not harmless. 
And I'm going to show you this one especially. There's a lot of harm that can follow here. So the first thing is, it just wouldn't work. I mean, there's a case study already. If you just had no punishment or, you know, a small punishment for every sin, it just wouldn't work. I mean, look at Genesis chapter 6. Look at Genesis. The second point is this. It justifies sin. It justifies sin. It's a convenient doctrine, and this is why, this is, I think, the reason, I think this is the main reason that people accept it. I think this is the main reason that people go to a church that, that preaches it and says it a lot, and they know in their conscience, in their, in, you know, in, their, in the law, in their hearts, that it's not true, but they accept it. Because look, it justifies sin. Turn to Matthew chapter 5. It justifies sin. Let's look at an example of committing adultery. Look at Matthew chapter 5. And look at verse number 28. Jesus is talking about he's preaching against adultery, but then he, in Matthew 28, he says this. He says, Matthew 5, 28, he says, But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. So, maybe somebody has some shortcomings, they're looking at things that they shouldn't in their life, and they're like, you know, well, I mean, I'm looking at these things on the internet. I'm committing adultery already. I mean, it's pretty much the same thing, you know, just commit adultery. It's, it's not the same thing. It's, it's a, they're both adultery, but to say that looking at something is as bad as actually committing physically adu physical adultery would be applying this doctrine to Matthew 5.28, that all sins are equal in the eyes of God. You know, this is where, this is where um, or someone that is committing adultery justifies it because of the fact you know, that somebody else is looking at a woman in a lustful way, so it's the same as me actually committing adultery. It's the same thing. Look, this is the whole idea of peer pressure. You ever heard of peer pressure, kids in school, whatever? Hey, man, everybody's doing it, man. Everybody's doing it, and then, you know, you think, oh, everybody is doing it. Everybody is sinning. So, you know, it's used to justify sin, and it's used to justify major sin in many cases. The second one is this. The second one is this. Turn to Romans chapter 2. It is used to give the impression, this false doctrine, that all sins are equal in the eyes of God. And now's where we get into the dangerous, even more dangerous territory. It is used to give the impression that everyone is capable of everything. This doctrine that all sins are equal in the eyes of God is used to teach that everyone is capable of everything, which is not true. Look at Romans chapter 2. Let's look at this idea, and I really want to just burn this idea into your, into your minds. This idea of our nature. We have been given a nature. I'm not talking about your personality. Romans chapter 2 explains it. Look at verse 14. This idea of man's nature. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law. These, having not the law, are a law unto themselves. So what he's talking about is now we have a situation where Jesus has come and they are out preaching the gospel to not only the Jews, but in Romans we're talking about the Gentiles. The Romans, the, the gospel has headed out to the Gentiles, people who are not Jews. They do not know the law. They've never seen the law. They've, they've never studied the law. I mean, we're talking about the Bible. They don't have the Bible. They've never seen the Bible. They were not given the oracles of God as the Jews were. But by nature, by their nature, they did the things that were in the law. Meaning the, the, the Gentiles who had never seen the Bible had laws, you know, they didn't, they didn't murder people. They had laws against murder. And they knew that murder was wrong and stealing was wrong and all these things that are in the law. They did by nature the things that were in the law, having not the law. Well, is that some kind of coincidence? No, Paul's explaining it in Romans chapter 2. Look at verse 15. Which show the work of the law. Well, they did have the law. They had the law. So we think that they didn't have the oracles of God. They didn't have the oracles of God written down. That was an advantage, Romans says, that the Jews had. What advantage hath the Jew? They had the oracles of God. But the, the, the Gentiles had the law too. And it tells you how they had it right here, which show the work of the law written in their hearts. And then he tells you what it is. Their conscience. Also bearing witness and their thoughts, the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. So their nature 
is the law written in their hearts, which is why they did the things that were in the law. Because, I mean, Paul, I mean, they, they must have thought it was, oh, they're doing the law. Well, they had it written in their hearts. That's why. That's what Paul, that's what the Bible is explaining. Now, now we know what the nature of man is. Now we know what's in our nature. We all have the law. We all start with that, remember? It's something we all, no matter if you were born rich, if you were born poor, if you were born into, uh, you know, uh, a Christian family, if you were born into a terrible family that was not a Christian family, you started with that law written in your heart. Everyone gets that from the beginning. Does everyone have the same chance to be saved? You know, everyone doesn't have the same great life, you know, that maybe born into a Christian home, but they have that. They have the law written in their heart. And that is what helps them to do the things that, that's their nature. Now we have to pay attention to Romans chapter 1 and the language used in Romans chapter 1. Remember what your nature is. Look at Romans chapter 1 and verse number 26. This is talking about people, people who have rejected God, who have turned on God, who have said we don't want to have anything to do with God. They hate God. And this is talking about what happens to those people. Look at verse 26. For this cause. Well, God didn't start it. God actually did start it with everybody. He gave them the law written in their heart. It came from Him. God gave everyone the law written in their heart. But for this cause that they turned on Him, he, God gave them up to vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use. Every time the word nature or natural is used here, underline it. The natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust towards one another, men with men, working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meat. Talking about homosexuality here. It's against nature. It's against that natural um, conscience that uh, every man was given. Look at verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, again, pointing out to the, to the main cause of this, for this cause, verse 26, God gave them over to a reprobate mind, rejected mind, to do those things which are not convenient. You know what not convenient means? It means not natural. It means not a natural thing. Not a thing that matches what your conscience that you were given tells you. So they were given over to this and they, they were turned to these affections that are not natural. Okay? Being filled with unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, nice people, backbiters, haters of God. That's, I mean, that's where it started. The haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. Four times here, five if you count not convenient, we see this word against nature, unnatural. We see this used again and again and again and again. It means against your conscience. It means against the law written in your heart. And the Bible explains everything, folks. You know, we may not like to talk about these things, but look, the Bible explains everything. And I do believe that most people in this world are very confused about this issue. But the Bible, look, you may not, you know, we're going to learn that there's some things we, you know, we need to be concerned about. There's some things in this world we need to worry about. There's some things in this world that the Bible's teaching us here that we need to take notice of. But look, at least we're not confused about it. Because we know. Any, but look, the point I want to make, and especially as things get even you know, worse and worse and worse out here, that any burning of lust that is not a man towards a woman is considered unnatural. And there's a reason that it happens. Okay, it's not, and look, this is not a sin that can just be committed by anyone because of the reason that it happens. Because of the turning on God, the hating of God, that is not something that can ha it can never happen to a saved person. Amen. So, look, not everyone has the capability to be a homosexual. Yes. Amen. Not everyone has the capability in a broader sense to do these unnatural things. Amen. So we can see, we know, when we see those unnatural things, we know that the Romans 1 path has taken place. Right. Right. I mean, that's why... We have the Bible so we can know these things. 
And we have the Bible. Turn to Matthew chapter 16. And it is so important that we listen to everything in the Bible because the safety of the church and the safety of our families, it depends on us listening to everything in the Bible. Look at Matthew 16 and verse number 18. Because Jesus makes us a promise here. Jesus makes us a promise in Matthew 16, 18. Look, I mean, we, we had a, we had a, I just popped in my head. When we were living in Sacramento, there was a, a serial killer that, and I won't even give you the details of the, the, the situation. He was caught and he hadn't committed his crimes for, I don't know, decades or whatever, but it was a huge thing in the 70s and 80s, I guess. He was, he was arrested and caught through all this new DNA, you know, tracking or whatever they can do. And he was caught like less than a mile from our house he, is where he lived in, in Sacramento. Look, you're not going to be like, oops, I'm a serial killer last week. Look, that's stupid to even think that. Something has happened to that person. Parents, here's the thing. Let me give you, you we got a lot of parents with young kids. Let me tell you something you're not going to, you're going to have to teach your kids a lot of stuff. You have to discipline your kids according to the Bible. You have to do all these things. Here's something you don't have to teach your kids. You don't have to teach your boys to start liking girls. You don't have to teach that. As a matter of fact, you have to follow the Bible and you need to cur curtail that. We need to make sure that we're teaching the Bible to our kids so when these, what are they, well, what's the word? When these natural things happen, we can, we can follow the Bible for the way that those things are supposed to be done with marriage and proper you know, relationships and things like this. Okay? It, it's, it's a natural thing versus unnatural. It's very, look, it's very simple. It's very simple. And, and it's, very, it's, it's explained very, very well in the Bible. Now look at uh, Matthew 16, 18. Jesus makes a promise. So why? Here's, here's the, the third thing that this doctrine is so dangerous because if this doctrine is taught, it will literally destroy the church. You say, what? If this, that, 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 that thing on its face could prove to you that it's a false doctrine, right there, because Jesus promises that nothing will destroy the church. If we operate the church according to the Bible, nothing can destroy the church. How do I know that? Because Jesus said so. Look at verse 16, or verse 18 of Matthew 16. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. And, underline this, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Jesus is saying, if you follow what the Bible says about the church, what it's supposed to be, what it's not supposed to be, it's like nothing, nothing can destroy this church. Do you know that this is God's church? Right. Jesus Christ is the head of this church. And, I mean, we had better preach everything that's in here. Amen. And if we do not, this promise is, is for not. Jesus is saying nothing will destroy my church. Now look, if all sin was equal, and anybody was capable of anything, then unnatural people, homosexuals, whatever, would be allowed in the church. All sin's equal. I've actually seen this happen in a church. It wasn't my church, but we knew, uh, I've seen this happen in a Baptist church. Or I've heard of this happening in a Baptist church. We knew some people that went to our Baptist church um, in North Dakota, and they grew up in a Baptist church where there was children in the church that were molested. I don't like talking about these things, but it's important that we understand the danger to the church. There were, there were children in the church that were harmed in this way. And the men that committed that act were allowed to stay in the church. Because, it's, well, are you perfect, brother? Are you perfect? Have you never made a mistake? Look, an adult being lusting towards a child is not, what's the word? It's not natural. Do you understand how important this word is? Do you understand how important the fact that God gave us a conscience in our heart is? Do you understand how important it is to listen to that conscience in your heart? No matter what TV tells you, no matter what the news tells you, no matter what pop culture tells you, do you understand how important it is for you to listen to what's written in your heart? That's why God gave it to you. God gave it to us to protect the church and to protect 
the families in the church and to protect the children in the church. You want to go do a Bible study on all the things that Jesus talked about children? I mean, you want to talk about the most, the most uh, strong language Jesus ever used. Jesus, long-haired Jesus with the sheep. <laughs> Talking about like killing people if they ever harm or commit any offense against a child. Amen. It'd be better if someone tied a millstone around your neck and drowned you in the sea. He said, I'm not going to, he didn't say, I'm going to tie a millstone around your neck. He said, it'd be better for you than when I get you. No, no, there's no Jesus with the sheep and the long hair. There's no Jesus in the long hair and the, in the dress or whatever. There's none of that. Jesus, it's, it's the flaming eyes of fire and the feet of brass. The King of Kings. And, and if anyone harms, I mean, the strongest language Jesus ever used was in the defense of the innocent. Once again, how I know we're, we're toast in this country. Because we have committed the biggest offense in this country against children. So, we understand that the natural and the unnatural is talking about our conscience and that not every person is capable of unnatural things unless they've gone through this process. It, it's, it's, a, it's a wicked end game to the doctrine of all sins are equal in the, in the eyes of God. It's not this peaceful doctrine. It, it leads to the destruction of families and it leads to the destruction of the church. I, I don't, look, I, I don't like talking about these things. I, I don't like talking about these things, but we must understand them, which is why we will talk about them, because the Bible talks about them. The Bible teaches us these things for our own protection, and I'm, I'm thankful for that. So look, all false, all false doctrine has an agenda. It is not harmless. It is not just some misunderstanding. It is lies from Satan himself. It is lies designed to disrupt God's plan, designed to destroy his church and his people, and this doctrine is designed to do both. It's, it's a very, very wicked doctrine. The opposite of this doctrine will bring you down a biblical path as we've gone down today of hard truths. But those truths will protect the church, they'll protect your family, and they'll protect, they'll protect all of us. They'll protect all of us. So look, there will never be any unnatural people that are allowed here. That's our action. That's our action out of this doctrine and out of what the Bible teaches to, for Jesus to, you know, and the gates of hell will never prevail against this church. Amen. And you can take comfort in that. You can take comfort in that. Look, you can take comfort in that because it's, it's a biblical truth. Don't walk through this life with blinders on. Because that's what a lot of people are doing. There are literal monsters around us. There are literal monsters around us. You ever do a search? I always do this before I move and, and buy a house anywhere. Do a search on, you know, sex offenders in the area. You will be shocked. And if you've never done it before, I'm sorry to wreck your day already. You're going to go home and, and do a search. But I always do that because I don't want... And you know what? There's no way you could ever, like, say, oh, I'm not going to move to a city without these people. Because they're everywhere. So don't be afraid. Don't let it derail you. Another thing... We need to be aware of it so we can take the proper action. Okay? And we need to be aware of it. Turn to Matthew chapter 10. But here's another thing. Don't let it derail you from your mission to love your neighbor. Bringing it back to James 2. Don't let it derail you from taking the gospel to a lost and dying world. So we have to be aware of these things but not be hardened. It's a tough thing. It takes some maturity to do that. Look at Matthew chapter 10.